Hey there, kids, and welcome to another eye-peeling, soul-crushing episode of What Happened, the show where we analyze and agonize over the mighty big failures of the mighty game industry. And if you're speaking of might, there is no other project, title, or evil curse comparable to the mighty levels of failure of KJ Inafune's Mighty Number no. 9. This is the first Kickstarter game we've covered here at What Happened, and while it won't be the last, it'll certainly be the hardest to top in terms of sheer infamy. So how did so many people get swept up in the fever of, Whoa, look, KJ Inafune might get sent to the next dimension. We gotta save him, everyone. Open up your hearts, your minds, and especially your wallets. Shit, I love Mega Man. How can we bring him back? Oh, uh, okay, well... That guy doesn't look nearly as, as charming or, or as cool as Mega Man, but but whatever, make it rain, y'all. Um, delays? Sh sure, here, here's a buck or two. Wait, three separate pleas for more funding. Wait, whoa, you're being delayed again? Cry like an anime fan on prom night. Ugh, fuck this. Okay, well, whew. So, what happened? Now, if you're one of the lucky few that missed this menagerie of moronity when it was happening, you need to get caught up. So, ahem. <coughs> KJ Inafune worked for Capcom. He's the father of Mega Man, but he's actually not. He didn't come up with his design and merely shepherded the franchise. He rose to the ranks for decades and forced the company to a big, stupid Western push that damaged it for years. He was then promoted again and just as quickly quit the company as he predicted doom and gloom for the Japanese gaming industry. Oh, how right he was. He then opened up two weird ass companies, Concept and Intercept, and then had a big, huge, really important, life changing announcement at PAX West in August of 2013. There, he officially announced a spiritual successor to Mega Man Mighty No. 9 and launched a Kickstarter live on stage to thunderous applause. <laughs> At the time, Capcom had a long history of kicking the shit out of Mega Man whenever it suited them. However, before those fans could settle into a nice, long, bout of depression, Capcom would announce a bunch of new Mega Man games and then just cancel them on you just as you were in mid-blink. Inafune was banking on those Mega Man fans to make this new Kickstarter success due to that ill will they had for Capcom, and let's be real, he was right to do it. Happy days were here again for all involved at first, as each and every stretch goal was smashed, re-smashed, and then smashed again. So despite asking for $900,000 for the base game, Comcept was able to amass a grand total of over $4 million, making it the most successful video game Kickstarter at the time. Who made this all possible? Well... EVERYONE! Now, before we get our hands really nasty, I'll take a moment right here to let you know where I'm headed with all this. The Mighty Number no. 9 Kickstarter is a masterclass in mismanagement, miscommunication, and pretty much any other negative term that has miss in the title. If you want to see an excellent rundown of every single thing Concept did wrong in that department, and there's a lot, please check out the Stop Skeletons From Fighting video on the subject as I can to a better job than that. So, I want to focus as much as I can on the development itself, with the information that's been made public and other bits and bobs that are fairly safe to assume. With that in mind, we're going to do something a bit different on this episode, and what I propose is breaking down the main problems of this garbage fire in three digestible chunklets for easier consumption. Keiji Inafune's concept was not a developer in the original sense, but rather a studio that would pitch ideas and, well, concepts. They would then farm out said ideas to other studios to do the heavy lifting. And in this case, the heaviest of lifting was done by Inti Creates, an independent studio that cut their teeth developing the Mega Man Zero series, as well as 9 and 10 respectively. Since Inafune had worked with them before, it was only natural for them to team up again. So far, so good. However, the first signs that Comsep was biting off more than their mouth could possibly chew was right there in the stretch goals. One key tenet of any creative project is to know your limits and not to overpromise or overstretch, as it will inevitably lead to complications down the road. And I present to you complications down the road. Mighty Number no. 9 was promised to come out on 10 different platforms altogether, which is an insane amount for any studio or studios to handle. 
Hell, some people can't even get one version of a game right, so promising 10 of them is the type of naive foible that makes the show possible. Now, while producing so many versions of one game is a monumental amount of work, there's another aspect to it that some people might not realize. To make the porting process go as smooth as possible, you need to design for something. Something called the lowest common denominator. In this case, that would be like the Xbox 360 or the 3DS, it, it doesn't matter. What does is that Integrates had to make something that could run across a variety of different machines, from PC to Japanese consoles to American ones. It just needed to be flexible and basic, so no one platform would give them any trouble. Since we are talking about Mighty No. 9, however, trouble had a way of cropping up regardless. The year this whole thing was announced, 2013, is a date that's intrinsically linked to a lot of its core problems. Comcept and friends found themselves smack dab in the middle of a technological generation that was transitioning to a new one. Their campaign kicked off in August, several months before the launch of the PS4 and the Xbox One, but tons of people still own 360s and PS3, so it wasn't exactly wise to leave them out of the loop. And, and don't forget about the Wii U! Yeah, lots of people tend to do that. Hey guys, what you got there? Oh, oh cool, can, can I have some? So, by the time Mighty No. 9 was first scheduled to come out in 2015, the PS4 and the Xbox One would be established, so Jesus, just throw those onto the pile. In the end, there wasn't much Integrates could do about all this. I, I bet they were shitting themselves with each and every stretch goal reached, like, okay, right, oh, oh shit, oh, g oh no. Now, the last thing we'll be touching upon when it comes to planning is another aspect that some might point to as the saving grace or the safety net of Mighty Number no. 9, the budget. Hey, yeah, you scream at your computers. My number nine made over four million dollars. That should have been enough to fix any problems during development. Four million dollars, huh? That's how much they made. Well, if that is in indeed what you think, then I have something that may surprise you, something that may shock and discredit you. Mighty number no. nine didn't make four million dollars at all. <gasps> It's been reported that Comcept, like a lot of Japanese companies at the time, were not fully aware of the risks of crowdfunding to begin with. Comcept, unfortunately, didn't account for this in their budget for the actual game. So, with some quick math, uh, 4,600,000, 40%, carry the three, we wind up with a rough total of 2.4 million dollars. Uh, wow. So, a budget that was almost halved, wasn't accounted for, and yet still needed to be stretched to fund all those ports? Not an auspicious start. Now, because of this money mismanagement, a lot of things like voice acting and DLC needed more money after Concept realized the miscalculation. Unfortunately, all three of them never made their initial goals. More on that later. But make no mistake, minor gameplay decisions, level design, and technical hiccups aside, this is really what crippled Mighty No. 9 right out of the gate. The next thing we need to address is that game development is hard, not gonna lie. A, a million things can go wrong at any time. Designs can change and unforeseen shit can jump out at you from behind an office desk 24 seven. Bearing that in mind, from the initial pitch to the finished product, a couple of things were altered during Mighty No. 9's development and a lot of them could probably be chalked up to the same thing, keeping things in line across all platforms. In various promotional materials, we can see that early on, Concept had produced Art of Beck, the new playable hero, transforming into various machinery like industrial hammers and power lifters, gaining tank-like treads to cross spike paths. This obviously shifted somewhere down the line and was never mentioned again for the rest of the campaign. Instead, the absorbing mechanic whereupon causing enough damage to enemies would let Beck instantly kill them through dashing was emphasized. This ability was underutilized to say the least, as Beck could simply dash infinitely through the air anyway, which trivialized certain stages, letting players skip a lot of sections. 
This really seems like a system that wasn't given enough time or thought as just limiting the amount of mid-air dashes or putting a cooldown on it could have halted it from abuse. You could then build challenging platform sections around the idea of dashing from enemy to enemy, but instead it's just a slightly novel way of killing them and not much more. This wasn't even the biggest thing Inti creates struggle with, however. Oh no, as that distinction goes to Mighty Number no. 9's multiplayer. Wait, it had fucking multiplayer? There was a competitive racing element where two players would square off online to see who could get to the end of a set stage first. It was a throwaway mode that was a stretch goal, so I guess it had to be there, but was it worth it? <laughs> Frankly, no, because this mode caused incalculable damage to the game in the long run, as well as for Inti Creates. But why? Well, because it was the first online mode they had ever worked on. Yes, prior to Mighty Number no. 9, this little studio had never tried their hand at direct online play, so it's fairly understandable it would be a little rough. And yeah, it was a little rough. Even at launch. Actually, especially at launch. Players would constantly be out of sync, run at different frame rates, encounter crashes, all of the etc. It was the single most unpolished bit of the game, and lots of people hated it. How many exactly? Everyone! So that's it for the main development, but of course we have to point out some of the many, many, many problems that the Kickstarter had. Backers, ugh, God, backers, never actually went in on any of the additional calls for funds that I mentioned earlier. Stuff like the voice acting for English, Japanese, and the Raid DLC all demanded their separate campaigns and budgets because again, Concept didn't actually have $4 million. Now, why these features were being added to bloat the already massive workload in the first place is anyone's guess, but since all three failed to meet their initial goals, Concept diverted money from elsewhere to fund just one round of voice acting. It's really weird though that they're pushing so hard for features that the majority of backers didn't want. I guess Mega Man fans weren't really interested in voice acting. I, I can't imagine why. Don't run away, coward. You'll pay for this insult. When we find that media, we'll find Dr. Wowie. Anyway, there was one other crowdfunding snafu that no fan of Mighty Number no. 9 wanted anything to do with, and that was Red Ash, the indelible legend. Now, to be honest, I don't really want to go into this whole thing as it doesn't really have anything to do with Mighty Number no. 9 per se. It's a whole other energy tank I don't feel like drinking. Ah, fuck it. Cliff Notes version then, let's go! Money number no. 9 is not finished. Comcept opens another Kickstarter for a Mega Man Legends spiritual successor. It looks very poor. Its campaign fails very fast. In 2015, Inafune said he had procured an outside source to fund it and that it will be completed. It's 2019 now, by the way, and there hasn't even been a soft fart about it since. Remember though, Comcept was an idea factory. They were free to pitch this idea since their design work on Mighty Number no. 9 was done, so by that measure, it wasn't really shady, just completely and utterly tone deaf. One last thing though, what does indelible mean anyway? Um, oh, that's... That's actually hilarious. Back on track. We are now entering the last major pivot point from Mighty Number no. 9, the involvement of Deep Silver and the cavalcade of poorly timed delays it saw in the last few months before launch. Comcept announced in April of 2015 that they had found a new partner that would publish physical copies for a myriad of platforms, and with the extra capital procured from the deal, could afford more voice acting, that Ray DLC, and oodles of localized languages. However, along with this glorious partnership meant a delay from spring of that year to September 15th, which totally makes sense. All of this new content needed a few extra months to be integrated into the base package, and a single delay is common for most Kickstarters anyway. However, on July 23rd, that September date turned into a I don't know date as online retailers started slotting in placeholders with no communication from the mighty team as to why. Then, at the very end of the month, they finally spoke up and confirmed that yes, Mighty Number no. 9 would slip to 2016. But why? Well, remember that online multiplayer mode that they were working on? Int Creates' first online multiplayer mode? That's why. Bugs were cited as the main reason for the delay, so it would require more time to iron them out. 
The new date was set for early February 20th. Never mind, the date is now set for spring 2016. Yes, and late January, Comcept announced a third delay, again blaming instabilities and the multiplayer matchmaking. Also, in case you forgot, since there's eight or nine, ten versions of the game, this one bug will require a lot of extra work to fix across all platforms. How long exactly? Well, let's just say up to June 21st. Of course, before that, we were all blessed with Deep Silver's now textbook example of how not to make a trailer for a video game. Do you like awesome things that are awesome? There's probably a dash that makes you breakfast. I don't know. I'm ready. No one's talking to you, Vernon. Mighty number nine. To Inti Creates' his credit, they did not approve of this ad and were pretty vocal about its qualities, like a lot of people were. We are now entering launch week, and if you weren't wearing your surprise face, you'd be excused because the launch of the actual game went, um, rather poorly. The 360 version was late by a few days. DLC codes the Ray level were missing. The Wii U version was a hot jar of mayonnaise. The 3DS and Vita ports were delayed, and physical rewards were only shipped out to Kickstarter supporters over a year later. Wait, what? Fangamer was to supply physical NES-style boxes to backers, but were waiting on Comcept to provide the funds to do so. The problem with that is that Comcept had no money. There's some guesswork here, but the regular physical and digital sales of Mighty Number no. 9 that any Joe Schmo could buy weren't particularly soaring. Thus, there wasn't enough money to power the production and shipment of those NES boxes that is until 2017, where Level 5 of Professor Layton and Nino Kuni fame purchased Comcept for some reason. One month later, Fangamer mysteriously started shipping the physical goods to Kickstarter backers almost a year after the fact. But better late than never, I suppose. It's safe to assume that the financial security of being bought by Level 5 was what made this possible, but eh, who knows. Also, the NESL boxes and manuals were missized. I gotta say, one thing you do so well, Mighty Number no. 9, is always staying 100% on brand. Of course, the fact that the game wound up being a middling, derivative platformer lacking much of the charm of the original Mega Man's did it no favors. Maybe if the Kickstarter communication had gone smoothly or, like, well at all, and there had been no delays, people might have cut it more slack? Regardless, Integrates were put in an unenviable position, had to be beholden to a number of stretch goals and restrictions, had less money to work with than initially thought, and were under constant pressure to not disappoint fans. It, it couldn't have been easy. Anyway, where are they all now? Comcept, now level 5 Comcept, are apparently working on a Dragons and Colonies title that seems to still be in development, although it's really hard to tell. And Afune, who has since shied away from doing any public appearances, for his part, has placed the blame squarely on himself. I own all the problems that came with this game, and if you want to hurl insults at me, it's totally my fault. I'm the key creator, I will own that responsibility. He has also echoed some of the statements and assumptions made here, specifically that maybe shipping on 10 SKUs was probably a massive mistake. In my many years at Capcom, they were known for their multi-platform strategy, but never did they do 10 SKUs all at the same time. 10 different versions, all for one title. Usually, you have the base game and work on the port after it was done. In this case, it was do the base game and do the port all at the same time. It ended up being a huge amount of work, more than we actually estimated. Now, he says 10 SKUs, but let's remember, those Vita and 3DS ports never actually shipped. The last official statement regarding this issue is that both versions would be completed and made available by the end of 2017, what the fuck? Things aren't all bad, though. Despite the massive amount of stress, uncertainty, and some ill will from fans, Inti Creates has gone on to great success with a streak of well-received games. Chief among these is their Gun Vault franchise, Blaster Master Zero 1 and 2, Dragon Mark for Death, and the crown jewel, Galgun. Galgun. Just goes to show that these types of scandalos don't always result in instant closure, just most of the time. 
Now, listen, Kickstarters are never a sure thing. In fact, they're susceptible to a whole host of problems that are unique to them, but it's unfortunately a fact that Mighty No. 9 damaged some people's perceptions of crowdfunding, which I don't think is really all that fair. Every form of media can disappoint and have things go wrong during the creation phase, and that's whether you are just supporting it with hype, pre-ordering it, or in the case of Kickstarters, donating to it. Money Number no. 9 was obviously mismanaged from many fundamental standpoints, but its intentions of course were good, although far, far too ambitious to deliver on. If you look at a campaign like Shovel Knight and how they structured and delivered on their promises, it resulted in one of the most loved and polished platformers in recent memory. So Money Number no. 9 is not a thing to point to so you can say crowdfunding sucks or doesn't work, but rather a cautionary tale that simply states, learn from our mistakes, cause damn, we made a lot of them. If you know of any other massive media misfires, slap them comments down on the video below or hit up the Flophouse VIP Patreon to participate in our next official poll. See you next time, Mighty Ones, and thanks for watching. Super